Godfrey Bloom, what three words would you use to describe yourself? Oh, gosh, that's a bit of an awkward one. Why is it awkward? England's ordinary bloke. <laughs> and, and representing the people speaking what... You know. I hope I do, yeah, I yeah. hope I do. Yeah. Yeah. In a September interview with us, William Dartmouth, UKIP MEP for the South West and Gibraltar... I know William well. Mm, he defended your comments when you said that giving £1 billion a month to Bongo Bongo Land is completely beyond me. He said that... There was a much more serious matter uh, in question there and disregarded the media's and public's interpretation of those comments. So what was, what was that point? Well, the point was, and I made this on an economic speech in Birmingham, yeah. uh, which was a 40-minute speech yeah. uh, about economics. Uh, but one of the th and I was talking about how government spending is out of control, very badly out of control, uh, the national debt is going up at 10% a year, which is, uh, which is an extraordinary phenomenon. Yes. Uh, we borrowed £120 billion last year. It doesn't matter to me, I'm old. You are young. <laughs> You're going to inherit all this terrible debt, mm. uh, and it's going to break the economy, and it's going to break fiat currencies. One of the points that I made that was picked up uh, by the press uh, was overseas aid and the morality uh, of giving away one billion pounds mm. of borrowed money when we are closing our hospitals, our A&E, we're reducing defence and police forces and so on and so forth. And I regard that as a moral question and I believe it's quite wrong to borrow from your future as a young man uh, to give money away with virtually no audit trail. Uh, and that was the point of that mm. speech, or that little tiny bit of that speech. Yeah. Yes, but buying Ray-Ban sunglasses, apartments in Paris, Ferraris, etc., those are extreme examples, aren't they, of where the foreign aid goes? Uh, well, I gave a lot more examples. Uh, of course, let's have a look at the F-16s that Pakistan bought for their two squadrons. Uh, we are giving money to India, which has a nuclear aircraft carrier programme, uh, money to Nigeria, which has a space programme, um, we have also uh, given 40% of our aid goes through the catalyst of the European Union, um, which is, has just given uh, 20 Mirage aircraft uh, to Argentina, which of course we could actually find if they tried to retake the Falklands, we could find the Royal Air Force actually in combat against Mirage Air Force, right. paid for by the British taxpayer. A huge moral question here, in my view. Okay. And uh, one thing I have, uh, if I'm going to be proud of anything I've ever done in my very yes, short political yes. career, it will be raising the issue of this moral dynamic. So UKIP as a party has now banned its representatives from using that term bongo bongo land, but as an independent MP, you're, you're free to use it again, so yes, will, will you be doing that? <laughs> it means that the UKIP thought police uh, aren't on my back. Mm. Uh, but of course, uh, interesting is it not, uh, that Bongo Bongo Land, the term Bongo Bongo Land, which uh, means, in my view, and most people's view incidentally, is a tin pot dictatorship type of country in the same frame as Banana Republic. But of course, uh, as you probably know, the phrase was used by Nick Robinson, the BBC political correspondent, uh, in his book only two years ago. You'll find it on page 216, Tales from Downing Street. So it's interesting that as I was then a UKIP yeah. MEP, there are words I can and cannot use. But if you work for the BBC, it's OK. Yes. It's a little bit of double standards going on here. Did you resign from UKIP or were you asked to leave? Uh, well, I had the whip suspended for a fortnight, um, and also oh, we're not still quite clear quite why, uh, because uh, the, 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 the UKIP have actually put out three different reasons why. Uh, so even UKIP aren't quite clear because it was a knee-jerk reaction. They made a mistake, let's be honest. They made a mistake. It was a knee-jerk reaction. They hadn't investigated anything. They didn't know what the hell was going on. Uh, they withdrew the whip for a fortnight, uh, and I said, look, I've been drifting away from some of UKIP's core values for nearly two years. I'll go and I'll plough my own furrow as an independent. Who gave you that phone call? How did you find out about that? Uh, I found out because uh, I tuned in on Saturday morning yes. uh, of the conference uh, and I tuned in to find out that uh, on television, uh, Nigel told me via television did he? this was happening. 
interesting. And did you have a conversation with him about it afterwards then? Uh, well, not really. Uh, you I mean, share a flat with him. We share a flat. Uh, with, there, there we are. He told me on television that yeah. I was fired, uh, and that's good. Uh, fair enough. That's what he wants to do. He's the leader. Uh, I'm fired. Uh, let's go for a pint of Guinness, which is pretty well what we did. Yes, and you're still friends. Yeah. And you don't talk about this. You talk about other things. Yeah, you know, life's too short, isn't it? Is it? Yeah. Is it? You've branded all politicians uh, smooth talking sociopaths. Yes. Right, so. Most, I think I should have said. I'm not suggesting you have misquoted me, but I should say most. You should say most. So, what about you yourself? Are you antisocial, criminal, and, and lacking in social conscience? Uh, no, I think, uh, I, of course, I would say this, wouldn't I? I think I'm the exception that oh, proves yeah. the rule. <laughs> uh, and I did actually I say, I think in the article, I believe that Dennis Skinner, the beast of Bolsover, is another exception that proves the rule. So not all, but certainly a very significant number. Should there be rules in place of who can actually become a politician? I think we have to review the, I think we have to review the democratic uh, procedures, the democratic uh, phenomenon that, that, that we now have. Mm. Uh, so if every, everybody gets a vote, uh, providing you're 18. Is this yeah. a sensible way of running a democracy? Uh, if you were, you need to be a shareholder of Marks and Spencers to vote on the board, you know, or, or the AGM rather. You need to be a shareholder. If you allow customers to vote uh, at the mm. AGM of Marks and Spencers, everybody would vote for free shirts, free knickers, free dresses, wouldn't they? So I think we have a serious democratic problem. Uh, if we want a democratic society, I think we need to review exactly what we've got. And I don't think a headcount system is the way forward. So not only limits on who should be able to vote, but also limits on who should be able to stand. Yes, I think one of the problems that we certainly have in the United Kingdom, and I think it's true probably of other countries as well, uh, is that we now have a, a, a class of politician who is a professional politician. Uh, they go into politics when they leave university. They're professional politicians. Uh, they are not. Most aren't men of conviction, men or women of conviction. They are in a job, like being a banker, or being a nurse, or being a shopkeeper, and that. they're in politics, and they get a salary, and they get a pension, a pension incidentally to die for. Uh, it is a job, though. It's a job. Uh, yes, I don't believe it should be a job. Uh, and we, what we need to understand, I think, as 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 a country, as a community. Uh, is <clears throat> that there is only two sorts of individual. There are those who create wealth and those who spend wealth. Now, it doesn't matter or consume wealth. It doesn't matter. You could be a very worthy individual uh, in the public sector. You could be a nurse, a radiographer, uh, a surgeon, a policeman. All very worthy and society needs those. But we now find ourselves in a situation where I think far too many people uh, are in, in a sector spending money without experience of creating money. And government now spends nearly 50% of GDP. So for every pound that circulates uh, uh, in the economy, 50p is now spent by government, spent by people with no experience how to raise the money in the first place. That is a problem. Mm. And who would determine the cri that criteria? Well, I think you'd need to review the Constitution right. and work out okay. how that should be. Uh, and uh, then you don't get this self-perpetuating self um, uh, sort of cartel. So, f give, you, give you an example, BBC. The BBC is a public body, it is funded by public money, which means that you never hear criticism of public spending per se. You will never have heard, ever, uh, the concept from any BBC national TV presenter that we have spent too much money or we spend too much money in the public sector and you could trawl the records back for the last 50 years. You simply won't find it because they are beneficiaries of public spending largesse. So uh, these big bloated public sector organisations mm. uh, need to be re-examined. They're going to have to be re-examined sooner or later because the economy is going to default at some stage. So this isn't a question of whether we have a better society or an improved society. We're heading towards the buffers. The situation is going to collapse, maybe not at Christmas, maybe not at Easter, maybe not in one year, two years. But we know the system is going to collapse sooner or later. And I think we ought to be addressing that now. You've claimed in the past that man-made global warming 
uh, is nothing more than a hypothesis that hasn't got any basis in fact. You've branded it a scam, scam, scam. Can you shout that phrase as loud as you possibly can at me and then explain where you get the, the evidence for those claims from? Okay, uh, well, let's just have a look at this scam. Yeah. And I believe it to be a scam. Uh, a scam, it, scam, scam, scam. Scam, scam, scam. Yeah. Uh, well, <clears throat> let's look at the facts. Yeah. Let's just deal with facts. Let's step back from the rhetoric. Okay. We know that the climate has changed. It's got warmer, it's got cooler. It's got warmer, it's got cooler. That is the nature of history which That's is irrefutable. Okay. But what is also irrefutable, and this is <clears throat> now substantiated by all the international uh, scientific institutions, we know that there's been no statistically significant global warming since 1997 and they are the IPCC's views so I would argue that it must be a hypothesis we know that carbon dioxide has trebled man-made uh, mm. has trebled we know that the global warming hasn't happened there's a significant amount of opinion now in the system which thinks we are entering a new uh, uh, a new ice age a new mini ice age so we know the facts, let's deal with just facts and not rhetoric and emotion. We know that the globe isn't warming in spite of the increase of man-made carbon dioxide, which is why I call it a hypothesis. Uh, and any independent scientific view would argue the same. Do you value votes and support from women as much as you do from men? Um, well, I'm, a, uh, uh, I'm an elected politician. I get elected by, uh, I don't know, I suppose 50% women vote for me, uh, uh, given that 50% of the women, uh, uh, of the electorate are women. Uh, uh, in, uh, when I was in UKIP, for example, you have to be elected by the membership uh, before you can go forward to be uh, elected by, uh, you know, the general electorate. Uh, and uh, UKIP are 50% uh, women members of UKIP. And so, yes, uh, I, I value it and I get it and I achieve it. Mm. In fact, funnily enough, uh, a lot of my most uh, uh, interesting speaking engagements are to uh, women's groups, women in business, uh, uh, Sir Optimists. I was the ga guest speaker at their international conference, their keynote speaker. So I speak a lot of, uh, of business women, uh, bus business women, and professional women's groups. So yes, I do. Yeah. That's a, that's a yes. Yeah. Right. It's just that you know claims that your comments, of course, calling women sluts, a joke. Obviously, we know you know your defence of of those remarks, but that they don't clean behind the fridge enough. Those can be interpreted as, as quite bluntly sexist. Well, not by, not my post bag doesn't reflect that. Now, if you look at Janet Street Porter, or if you look at Polly Toynbee mm. in The Guardian, they like to take bits out of context to portray me as a sexist, uh, which of course is absurd. Uh, and if you were to interview any of my female colleagues, mm. you would find that the, the, the implication I was sexist or misogynist as being absolutely absurd. But of course, in politics, uh, it suits my political opponents to paint me into that corner. You know, well, they would, wouldn't they? But that's, that's, po that's not about me, that's about politics. Let's talk about your new autobiography. Mm -hmm. Just give me a minute, that book that's just come out. Um, you said of the public mourning after Princess Diana's death in, in the book that um, weeping reminiscent of an Arab nation at a state funeral where the culture demands heart on sleeve behaviour, that made you deeply embarrassed. Yes. What's wrong with emotion? There's nothing wrong with emotion in the right place. Okay. Uh, and I wept at my mother's funeral, of course I did. Uh, and uh, I would weep at any friend or member of my family, of course I would, and so would you, that's natural. But what I don't like and what I find is unsettling as a nation uh, is to produce a sort of heart on sleeve emotion. Yeah. Uh, contrived emotion in many cases, fake, that you get in North Korea where they actually executed people who didn't weep enough. They weren't upset enough at Kim Il-jong's Il mm. demise. So you have people bawling and weeping uh, you know, on the streets of London and all their only their only knowledge or, 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 or of, of 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 Princess Diana, who I have met on a number of occasions, she's a very she was a very nice lady. But that sort of overt uh, uh, that 
over sort of emotionalism I think is degrading to a nation and I'm not alone in that a lot of English people felt that and a lot of my continental and American friends felt the same mm. way of course some people absolutely disagree with that but they're entitled to of course they are. If you want to weep and bawl and gnash your teeth because a complete stranger's died and you've only ever seen her on the television, please do so, but don't expect approbation from me. Mm. So what about your future yourself? Are you looking at a future in politics? Will you stand again as an MEP, perhaps even as, a, as an MP after that in 2015? Well, I don't know, Oscar, the answer to that is I don't know. Uh, I, Harold Wilson said a fortnight's a long time in politics, yes. so we've got six months. Uh, so, so I don't know, I haven't made my mind up. Certainly at the moment, if we had a European election under proportional representation on Wednesday week, mm -hmm. I could win my seat as an independent. I don't think anybody would dispute that. Uh, but of course in six months time, you know, things go off the boil, things changes. Six months is a long time in politics, so I don't know. Do I want to be? I've done 10 years, do I want to be? I don't know that I really want to be anymore. I've done a good 10 years, I've had a, I've, I've had a fair whack. Um, you know, maybe I'll move on and do other things. And is Nigel Farage asking you these things, or is that not concerning him just yet? Uh, no, Nigel. Uh, I think Nigel's uh, concern at the moment is to make sure that the UKIP party win the most seats at the European election in June more than anybody, any other political party. That's his major concern. But of course, you you share a flat, so there's a personal interest for him as well. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, you could argue that, of course, but uh, I think uh, I think UKIP will come mm. first. I think we'll come first. How much do you reckon is a sensible amount to drink before making a speech in the European Parliament? Um, well, I've made somewhere in a hundred speeches in the yes. European Parliament. Um, about a hundred speeches I've made in the European Parliament. I get more hits on my speeches than anybody else. I get, I've had over now one and a half million hits on my speeches yes. uh, uh, worldwide. Um, I think, it, well, who was it, uh, the Conservative Party politician? I'd lunch very well when I made a, a speech on financial services. I think I'd had three or four pints in the sunshine, which was less than wise. But I think uh, the Conservative politician whose name escapes me for the moment, Dan Hannan, right. uh, he put on his blog uh, that I'd been, what was it? I had to be carried out by the interns or something like that, uh, which I thought was rather amusing. I know Dan quite well. Simply not true? Well, come on, I'm 13 stone. Uh, and of course you can see the clip, the clip's on my own website. Mm. Um, uh, I think uh, there's a difference between needing to be carried out uh, and being slightly slurred of speech. I mean, you're an undergraduate, you know the difference, don't you? <laughs> and finally, Godfrey Bloom, I think you're a keen dancer and rejected, I think, Strictly Come Dancing, an approach from them, um, because you said, I think, that you have to be really physically fit to be able to do it, and it's a lot of effort. Um, we spoke to Vince Cable last month, who's also uh, very into his ballroom dancing, and he told us some of his other hidden talents. What are yours? Uh, hidden talents? Um, oh, they are pitifully few, I'm afraid. Pitifully <laughs> few. Uh, I can still, on a good session at Pocklington Rugby Club, manage an eight-pint session without being carried out by interns. Have, so, you, have you attempted a Hagathon? in honour of William Hague drinking, I think it's 14, 12 or 14 pints in. 14 is beyond my, beyond my measure these days, although um, when I was playing rugger at, uh, at 22, 23, uh, I think uh, I, I would expect 12 to 14 pints, otherwise I wouldn't have had a decent evening. Mm. Uh, but now eight pints, uh, and should anybody <coughs> not believe me, if they want to come to Pocklington Rugby Club and pay for them, I'll show beyond any doubt that I can <laughs> drink them. Godfrey Bloom, thank you for joining us. Really Great pleasure. It. Thank you Cheers. for inviting me. Cheers. How hard did you hit Michael Crick with that <coughs> conference brochure, by the way? It looked brutal. Well, I used to box lightweight in the army, and I can yeah. tell you, if you think that's brutal, when I was your age, he'd still be in hospital. <laughs>